Greetings and thanks for coming. Uh, this is a thought number one for the evening. This is from the, the uh, novel 1984. Everybody hear me in the back? Is any any problem, any issues there? We good? Thanks. Uh, so it's a little bit about the 1984. If you know the, if you know the book, or well, the guy's job is to sort of rewrite the past uh, according to the uh, uh, the, the uh, government's present uh, policies and, and plans. And so we'll get into a little bit more of that. Uh, second thought, just before we begin, you can imagine if you live in a country where you think they're not telling you the truth, um, this uh, uh, you know may keep you keep you, keep you up at night. So the presentation is called Greets from Room 101. Uh, I'm Kenneth Gears, and uh, um, probably suffices for an intro. Uh, so in the book, right, um, I would say that there's a government information warfare against its own, its own people. And there's a lot of use of technology. It's very interesting to consider in light of the internet. Um, they use uh, two-way telescreens, so in each, in each apartment, each uh, home, uh, the government can see you, and you can see a representative of the government all the time. Uh, room 101 is where you go if you get too clever, uh, if you, know, you start questioning things too much, or you uh, get a little bit too smart. Um, let's uh, look at a quick uh, clip of how this was envisioned in 1949 when uh, Orwell wrote the book uh, 1984. Starts with an alarm clock. <coughs> 30 to 40 group, take your places please. Right. Let's see which one of us can touch his toes. Right over from the hips, brothers and sisters, please. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Smith, 6079 Smith W. Yes, you, bend lower. You're not trying, watch me. That's what I want. Anyone under 45 is perfectly capable of touching his toes. I'm 39 and I've had four children. We don't all have the privilege of fighting in the front line. Remember our boys on the Malabar front. Just think what they have to put up with. So he's telling her, look, you know, I agree with you. I'm going to touch my toes. I'll try harder. Um, and uh, let's move on. The uh, year 2007. Um, really, by, day by day, I think the internet is is getting more and more into our lives. If you compare it with traditional media, the uh, the newspaper and the radio and the television, much much more limited, and actually much much more easy or uh, to control on the part of a, a government, right? So the internet all of a sudden changes things because you know, whereas the government, if it was only in charge of the the newspaper, that's really slow. That comes out once a day. Um, the television, uh, pre-programmed, uh, radio, the same, right? So you may only have a few channels in the country, but you, you have to realize with a, with a computer and an internet connection, each of you has a printing press and a radio transmitter in your own house. Uh, and so this makes it very, very much different for governments to deal with, especially in really authoritarian ones, right? Um, one of the things, I, I guess, about the briefing is that the, uh, the nature of the Internet is very, very unpredictable. It sort of is changing by the day. Um, and so uh, second, perhaps part of the thesis is that there is good and evil in life. There's good and evil on the Internet. And it really, it's up to all of us to help shape it and help define uh, you know, better paths for us to go down. I mean, some of the things that are going on, if you saw some of the other talks, uh, um, really in, the, in, in, in the, the way the soldiers speak, you know, soldiers talk about killing people and breaking things, right? That's their job. Uh, the Internet more and more is becoming a weapon. Uh, and you can see that when you read about the use of IPv6 and other things, the way the Department of Defense and the government is, is viewing the Internet. Um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, in this briefing about government repression and criminal uh, pursuit, legitimate and illegitimate. Now, if you were hired by a, a despot, 
in a bad country, right, to advise him or her on, on the Internet. I think one of the first things you would say is do not trust it if you bring it in in any quantity uh, into the country. Uh, you really, if you want to keep control of your information space, you, ha you, you, know, you have to take serious precautions. Uh, there's some funny things, like in Turkmenistan, you know, these guy, that guy started naming the months of the year after members of his family. Right? That's one way to cut down on the information space. Um, in, in Kyrgyzstan, we see that when they didn't like what were the, the news was playing, actively there would be active DDoSing of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of news uh, media. Um, now, one of the things you tell them, too, is that, that there's good reasons for, for censorship, right? I mean, because all of us could probably think of something that we would disallow. Um, but then once you give the government the tools that it needs uh, in order to prosecute crime, in order to collect data, those are very powerful tools. And of course, of course they can be used not only for criminals, but they can be used for political adversaries. And sometimes the lines get so crossed, you have no idea whether you're really looking at a criminal or a political adversary, um, perhaps even the, uh, the prosecutor. Now another thing is, is if you would say if you're going to use technology in this country in order to, to uh, you know, further your reign, to keep control on the people, um, you say you, know, you, you want to deliver unaltered messages to your people and you want to deny that right to your, your adversaries, uh, your political adversaries or would-be uh, overthrowers. Um, and that the internet can help, right, especially state-owned telecoms make it a lot easier to surveil and manipulate traffic. So that's why you'll see in some of these countries what they're trying to do is really develop some kind of a quasi-state monopoly situation, even if it's a private firm, uh, so that one, they can have visibility on the traffic, and then two, there's a, lot of be there's a lot of money to be made in telecommunications, and they don't want people making long-distance phone calls, uh, they don't want people using VoIP in this day and age because that, that, that sort of lowers the amount of uh, money coming into government coffers. So cyber tactics are, are really, you know, you know them. Uh, you know, essentially, you can read traffic, you can delete traffic, black hole it, or you can modify it. And as, as you get into the modification area, then it gets more sophisticated, more clever. Uh, but it's very doable, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's really powerful. And you can, you can, you know, you can collect on, on anything, really, as the network uh, traffic flows along. Um, now, when, when you see certain things, you, you can call law enforcement, uh, and you can knock on somebody's door. Uh, and there's a lot of plausible deniability for governments in this, especially in cyberspace, you know, because you really, it's not something you see, it's not something you feel uh, until, you know, the knock comes at the door. And, you know, in terms of international politics and human rights, the, you know, the, just look at Zimbabwe, for, for example. I mean, over the last 15 years, you had one guy who essentially took it from perhaps the best country in Africa to the worst country in Africa. And, you know, basically, he, n nobody is threatening invasion. Nobody is threatening replacing this guy. I mean, you, you really have to, you really have to uh, um, imagine pretty terrible scenarios before... Um, sort of a human rights situation will affect somebody's political tenure. None of us has complete access to the internet, right? So it's, you know, it's all filtered in some form or fashion uh, as it travels. And so uh, you can think in some of these countries about uh, being sort of an Eastern Albonian from Dilbert situation in which you, you know, you're, you're only going to get a small piece of the internet. And a couple of basic strategies are basically blocking international sites. Um, and then you heavily regulate through taxation, registration, re-registration, and re-registration, uh, and question and answer periods, asking for log files, requiring the ISP to buy software and hardware that it can't afford. Um, all of those uh, are reasons uh, uh, that the government can very easily uh, maintain control over telecommunication space. Um, Go on to the next slide. Uh, it's not easy, though. The thing is, is all of us know, especially if you work in any kind of computer network defense role, that it's very difficult to, to, to collect the right traffic, to store it, database it, uh, you know, um, normalize the data, analyze it, have somebody who can write a decent report and somebody that, you know, to read it and care about it and act on it. Those are, those are all major variables. Uh, and so really all governments are, are dealing with this. Um, Let's see. And your political adversaries in real life, 
they're going to be your political adversaries in cyberspace. So once you let the internet into your country, I mean, you can bet that both sophisticated users and hostile network operations uh, targeting you are a certainty. Now, a couple of ways to approach uh, controlling the internet are one, uh, through a denial of sin. And this is fairly easy because even, you know, a programmer um, could do this fairly quickly. If you go through the dictionary, um, uh, there are a lot of words in there marked vulgar. And so each one of those, you could just say, pull that out and, and deny that type of traffic. Uh, right? So pornography is easier to do than politics. The problem is, is very quickly when you begin to censor traffic, it's very easy to over-censor traffic. So here's just a couple of examples. But I mean, if you're in a country like Saudi Arabia, which is really trying to have a moral internet, as they put it, um, all of a sudden you get to a place where you can't look up information on breast cancer, for instance, because it's not wanting you to look at certain words, right? So it's even possible to poison a web server in that sense if just place information on your adversary's uh, server that you know is going to cause that IP to have trouble getting into the country. With politics, it's much, much more difficult because essentially you're talking about words in context, not words that stand out by themselves as marked in the dictionary as being a problem. Uh, but you're talking about words that mean nothing in and of themselves, but when you put them together have a very powerful meaning. Now the problem is, is for artificial intelligence is that people can't even really perceive, uh, you know, whether it's constructive criticism sometimes or somebody is really taking a pot shot at you, um, much less humor, etc. Uh, you really need a subject matter expert who's totally familiar in the, the language, the history, and the culture. And it, it, the, the smaller the circle of power gets, obviously it's going to have an inverse relationship to your ability to be able to monitor the traffic. So you can imagine in a, a one-man show type of country like North Korea, there is just no way that you're going to be able to, to properly um, sort through uh, political traffic. And so basically you're going to deny everything. So blacklisting and whitelisting, uh, you know, blacklisting, essentially looking for words, string matching, should be a two-stage system. What people are going to go to is whitelisting, right, because you, you can't, uh, it's too hard to do a proper blacklist type situation. And so what you're going to do if you, if you want to have a fairly restricted network space uh, and hang on to power is say, I'm going to give you, a, you know, a couple of news sites, a couple of weather sites, um, some sports, just enough porn to keep you happy, and that's it. You're not going to go anywhere else, right? Because I just don't have the time uh, to, to sort through your, uh, your requests for traffic. Now, there's the supply side and there's the demand side. So we talked a little about the supply side. The demand side can also be heavily affected, especially in countries where people are afraid of the government. So uh, through its, whether it's physical or virtual uh, intimidation, you can definitely affect the demand side of Internet traffic. On the government side, on the hiring side, security personnel definitely, uh, you're going to have to change your hiring practices, right? Because you know, no longer does the truncheon ping mean what it used to, right? It, there's a, ping has a whole different uh, um, connotation these days. And so the, the people you bring in for security management, they're going to have to know something about the Internet. Uh, uh, in order to uh, police the country. So here's kind of four possible commandments if you were going to allow internet into a, a really restricted um, political space. Um, I would say you probably want all accounts officially registered. You know, and you want them to show up with their ID, and you want them to show up at the, the central telecommunications building that's next to your internal security service, right? And they're going to have to give their name and address and your ID number. Now, all the traffic that comes from that account has to be attributable to that account. Um, users can't share or sell their connections, and they can't encrypt their connections either. So that's going to cause you big uh, pain uh, in decryption. How do you get this stuff? You know, when governments look at the situation, they have some of the same exact uh, questions to answer as you do for your home network, right? Should I rely on the little icon in the system tray to tell me that I'm safe? Right? Or do, am I going to have to hire people who are going to have to learn how to write snort rules and learn how to database traffic and examine that traffic and try and tell me if it's causing me a problem? Right? These are huge questions for them to answer. Um, here's four countries, uh, Myanmar, Belarus, Zimbabwe, and Cuba, who all, have all bought internet surveillance systems from China. 
There is a corporate connection to this. Um, now, the industry, they will come back with a, it's kind of a, a solid response in the face of the privacy advocates. How can you make this stuff and how can you sell it? They say, look, you know, our products are politically neutral. Um, just like whips and just like chains, right? You can use them for anything. You can use them to pull a car out of the swamp or you, know, you can use them to, to tie somebody to the wall. Um, but their products, they say, look, you know, we can't control how somebody's going to use this uh, product. Um, Customization is key because you're talking about selling to foreign countries that have different cultures and languages and backgrounds and laws. And so these, these companies, they obviously have to study the, the uh, and it's really the lucrative targets these companies want to, they want, they don't really want to advertise, but they want to be known for selling Saudi Arabia, for selling China, for selling, you know, a big country, a big country, a, uh, the software, uh, right? So that's a big coups for them. That's just like anywhere in business. Uh, here's one from Scandinavia. This is free. You can download it to check it out. And on the website, it says, you know, this is for a grammar school, uh, theoretically. But but you can, it says, you know, you can go from unobstructive to draconian. And so by IP, for instance, through algorithm matching for stuff that you want to come up with on your own, uh, you feel like somebody may have a covert channel in the traffic and you want to um, fish it out of the traffic. So you can write a, cu you know, a custom script for that. Um, has whitelist and then stealth mode. So with stealth mode, you click on that and it's going to allow people to go to a bad site, but it's going to alert these uh, law enforcement and security personnel at the same time. So last slide in this section, chance fatal or TCP IP, um, governments have a wide array of tools at their disposal, but I think they're hard to use and they're a little understood in most of the countries who are trying to, uh, to use them. Um, so you can blacklist IPs, uh, but one of the things, once you get down into countries that own their telecommunications, lock, stock, and barrel, you're talking about having the ability to essentially own the dictionary. Now there's a really interesting part of the book 1984 uh, in which the government is trying to prove that it can do anything with its people and it's telling Winston that 2 plus 2 equals 5, right? And he's like, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, when you own the dictionary, right, when you own your top-level domain, when you own all the DNS servers, um, you can say 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? You can do things like download Amnesty International's .org website and you can take off your country-specific information and you can repost that site within your country. Who's going to stop you doing it, right? So as you get down all the way to the bottom, then developing websites just as bait Right, just to pull people out of the woodwork, your political adversaries. Um, all this is possible uh, in the internet. So I came up with a, uh, this is part two, um, a, a top ten countries to look at. And I don't have any access to grind against these countries. I didn't really come up with them. I just looked on some of these main, uh, you know, human rights, freedom of the press sites. And they, they provide a lot of uh, information to look at, sort of case studies that, that are readily uh, available. Um, some of it was just subjective analysis. I kind of had to put a list together. You'll see that some of the countries uh, we'll look at, they're just snapshots really, um, are very technologically sophisticated and some are not. But then I kind of had to sort of place sort of uh, them in context as well. So Freedom House, this is, this is a, a, uh, an outfit that categorizes, you only fall in one of three categories, free, partially free, and not free. Um, I will tell you that that, uh, that is somewhat crude, but all of the countries we're going to look at in this briefing actually fall into one one of those colors. Uh, Reporters Without Borders, they rank countries top to bottom on a uh, list of uh, uh, freedom of the press. Uh, so as you see, uh, Scandinavia is right there at the top. And uh, Eastern Europe as well. So notice Eastern Europe, this is great. Um, I was there not too long ago, and, and the... Uh, I would highly suggest going to Eastern Europe these days because they are really doing, I think, pretty well these days. They sort of, you know, have a, come out of a long sleep through the Warsaw Pact days uh, and are really trying hard now to, to, to uh, develop integrity, I think, in law and in um, taxation and international affairs. Uh, to, to the, anyway, I don't want to bore you with that, but you will we'll see them on the top ten list. We're going to look at the bottom of the list, and most of the countries uh, we're going to look at are there, but as we go, go through them, I won't give them away just yet. Uh, yes, I think it was about 40, something like that. I think it was about 40, and that may be Fox News dragging it down, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, see, uh, so number 10, Zimbabwe. Uh, let's see. 
So in Zimbabwe, I had found one post on the internet which said on uh, October 20, 20th, 2006, uh, President Mugabe got together with uh, his uh, version of the CIA, and he said, look, we've got a lot of people in our country who are sending out a lot of bad information about our country. You got to find them. You got to find where they are, and here's some of the things you're going to do. I mean, you got to get in the ISPs. Um, I want you to flush out the journalists. I want you to, if you have to, pose as cafe attendants and surfers. Um, and you may need some computer training first, which again, we were talking about earlier. I mean, it's ridiculous to think, you know, I mean, this is actually hard stuff. It's not easy uh, to do. Uh, so one of their strategies is guarding the gateway. So essentially, they would like to develop a uh, sort of a, a, um, an ability to have visibility on all the traffic, but also all the revenues that come from that quasi-governmental uh, telecommunications firm. Let's see. So they have legal... Uh, the, backup for what they're doing, uh, and they're putting the burden on purchasing these uh, hardware and software onto the ISPs, which, which they're complaining about. So for each country, we'll just look quickly at a, a, de a defacement of a government site, right? So this happens to be from Command Tribulation, which is a Brazilian uh, Christian evangelical de de defacement group. But just we'll look at one for, uh, for each of the countries, to, just to provide some, uh, some diversionary uh, eye candy. Number nine is Iran. Uh, one of the things about Iran is phenomenal internet growth. So again, step back and you think about that from a government perspective, over the course of 10 years, your country is going from virtually not being connected to the internet to everybody being connected to the internet. Um, so just the changes mind-boggling, especially from the standpoint of, you know, security and control uh, and all of that. Now, one of the things I saw just reading from sort of the NGO type uh, uh, reports was that it's, it's really pretty mature uh, network surveillance there, but tends not to be draconian. Basically, they're trying to, they're, they're not messing too much with the demand side, but on the supply side, they said at any given time about, about a third of websites that they, you know, because they've got a large list of websites that automatically, you know, they'll get in the country and they'll try to go to a wide range of sites and report back how many of them were, were we able to go to uh, on any given time, and about a third are blocked, especially porn anonymizers uh, and politics, and especially if it's in the local language. Um, the, uh, blogging is huge. Um, you see a lot of good communication. A lot of communication is critical of the government, even on the part of legislators uh, within the government. Uh, one guy, for instance, when he got the blacklist, he was a system administrator, he got the official government blacklist, so he just posted it. He was that angry about it. Um, they, you know, so, like I said, blogging is huge. They've even accused the CIA of using blogs to undermine the government. So, so it's, it's, it's a healthier environment here. Um, here you see the President Ahmadinejad's own blog. And this is very interesting. He's got a message to the American people. He's got a question about the structure of the UN. He's got letters coming from, you know, at least according to the website, right, from, uh, from American and Britain. Uh, here's a, a web defacement, a Turkish defacement group using a, a Native American theme to deface a, uh, an Iranian site. Very cool. Uh, number eight, Saudi Arabia, right across the uh, Persian Gulf. So we talked a, a tiny bit about Saudi Arabia. Um, searching for the, the moral internet. They have something called the King Abdul Aziz C City for Science Technology. It's a national level proxy, right? So anything, they've got a lot of ISPs in Saudi Arabia, but everything is supposed to flow through this one site. Um, and it's supposed to eliminate the negative aspects of the internet. Now, if you go to a site, now they use caching, blacklisting, and then it's triage. So it's got some artificial intelligence built in. And if you go to a site that it's never seen before, it'll try to make a determination. It's obviously based, by key, based on keyword. But you'll get pop-ups. It'll say that this, in Arabic and English, it'll say that this, this site is disallowed and, and your request is being logged by, by, the, by the, uh, the, the ISP. Encryption forbidden. ISPs have to conform to Muslim values. Um, but the Saudi, Saudi officials have said, look, this is really hard. We can't, we can't keep up. They're, they're fairly honest about this. Um, one of the things happening in Saudi Arabia is that people are just buying satellite dishes and they're connecting. We'll talk about this a little bit later with just overall strategies to get around censorship, but they're just buying sa satellites and they're going to foreign ISPs. Uh, so that's a problem there. Um, but back to the, the basic strategy within the, the, uh, the government. So it's morality and politics. They've said it's morality. It's not politics. But at least one case, uh, there is this uh, London-based uh, opposition group, Mira, and the, uh, the government's really played a long-running cat-and-mouse game with this group. And so it's, it's definitely an example of, of political blocking. 
Um, one of the interesting things in the country is they have blacklist removal and addition forms. So if you, if you don't like uh, you, the results you get in a query, say, look, I'm looking for information. I'm not getting it back. See if you can do something about this. And they say they get about 500 a day. Here's a Pakistani slash Saudi um, defacement of government site. Eritrea. So moving into Africa, um, less technologically uh, advanced. In fact, they were the last country in Africa online. Now, they had a very healthy in Africa history of, of, well, of warfare, unfortunately, in Eastern Africa, but also um, clandestine radio, sort of between them. And so this is slowly but surely uh, moving on to the internet. Um, as last online, you can see in 2000, you can imagine how long it would take to download a web page at 500 kilobits coming into the entire country uh, per second. Um, so in East Africa, the, the um, I've only been in Eastern, Sub-Zero Africa, but you know they don't have cinemas per se. You get out out of the main towns. Of course, they have cinemas in big towns, but they, you know everybody would have a. Uh, you go into a house and somebody would have a TV and a VCR and charge a nickel or whatever it was, and that was kind of the cinema for the town. So uh, ISPs, you know, a lot of people aren't wealthy enough to afford a computer, but so they typically walk in affairs. Unfortunately, they were the last online and really the first offline in in Africa since 2001. Human rights have been really going downhill. Uh, actually, I just a guy from. Eritrea was in my cab driver coming over here from Caesars a little while ago, and he was complaining about this, the, the uh, human rights situation in Eritrea. I said, you've got to get, do something about the, the, uh, the president. But by 2004, cyber cafes had all been moved to education and research centers. You know, people who in the know in the area said absolutely not. The government basically cited pornography, but basically the, what was in cyber cafes uh, in the country, are they're not supposed to be anymore. Uh, number six, Belarus. This really provides us one of our best case studies, really interesting. Much um, technology level of education, very high uh, in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. But this country is really anachronistic uh, in that um, they still call the security service the KGB. It's the only, I believe, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, still, they, they, don't, they don't bother to change it. Very Stalinist there. The presidential administration still runs um, the newspaper, the radio, the television. Um, and within the KGB, you have this, this thing called the State Center for Information Security, and they own the top-level domain, they own the DNS servers, uh, and there's been a lot of funny games over the past few years with uh, going to websites in the country. Uh, you can see in, in, in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, um, when there, there was a referendum for the president, re presidential election, all this, you saw a lot of uh, stuff happening. Uh, last year in March, a huge uh, cyber showdown in the country, really, they had a presidential election, and both sides were trying to use use uh, the internet to their advantage. Um, and uh, the, the government actually tr was trying to put infrastructure out into the country because its supporters were largely older and rural. Uh, but they couldn't keep up with the, uh, the opposition groups because they were younger and urban. Uh, but on election day, uh, uh, 37 at least uh, opposition media sites were inaccessible in the country. Uh, this is fairly crude, but it's true. Um, and the presidential challenger site was dead. Um, funny DNS errors were uh, reported subsequently. One week after the elections, there were uh, demonstrations in the Capitol. Riot police came out. There was a bunch of arrests. And again, the internet inaccessible from uh, the Capitol. Uh, the president won by a large margin. Uh, here is a liberty of expression, uh, specific defacement uh, uh, within uh, the government's of Belarus. Number five, the top five, I would say, are even much more um, hard nuts to crack than the, t than the uh, six to 10. So number five is Burma. In Burma, it's illegal to have incorrect ideas. Uh, the net penetration is minuscule. Um, so those who can connect to the internet, I mean, it's told up front, no politics, no web mail, no anonymity, uh, and on top of that, no porn. Only state email, um, and uh, you told that if if you go into a cyber cafe, you know you have to show them your name, address, your ID card. Frequent screenshots are going to be handed over to the government, and you can go to prison for uh, any of the following, including uh, some vague criticism. Uh, resistance uh, pretty futile. Uh, there's been online activism abroad, and you'll see you know the the odd um, complaint against Burma, but you know basically. Uh, you know, business interests, national uh, security politics, and all that probably come before um, 
most other government policies. Uh, so the government, you know, probably uh, not too worried about this. The company that sold the software to the government denied it, denied it, denied it until an NGO uh, actually found a picture on the web of the prime minister of the country, their, sale, their own sales director, uh, closing the deal. Uh, here's a Turkish defacement of a, uh, of, a, of a a Burmese site. Number four is Cuba. Now, Cuba has a little bit different strategy. Cuba says, you know, basically all technology should be in the hands of the government. Uh, you know, it's not for private use. Um, the government's supposed to own all computers. And it's funny, in Cuba, you have very educated populations. So they've got good educational system, good health care. Um, nobody connected to the Internet. Uh, big problem. So they do have some cyber cafes. Uh, but again, what, if it's going to cost you half of your monthly salary to get almost no, no information back, you can imagine nobody's going to uh, even try. Um, so illegal connections to the Internet, five years. Uh, Counter-revolutionary information, 20. I mean, that's pretty stiff. Now, there was a, an NGO female in the country last year. She, she brought up a, uh, an email client, she, and she typed the names of a bunch of uh, Cuban dissidents in the email. She tried to send the email. First, she gets a pop-up on her screen that says, this program will close for state security reasons. And then her computer, according to her, crashed on her. There's a cyber black market in the country for hardware because it's so rare, but also for these things called connection codes. So if you're a student or you, or you, live, or you work in a, in a company that actually is supposed to have some access to the internet, you get a connection code. Um, and these are, these are on sale on the black market. Another uh, Turkish defacement. Uh, so number three, China. China is uh, um, perhaps not the most malicious or most authoritarian uh, in this sense, but it does get the, uh, the three ranking uh, for having the most sophisticated surveillance. All of these uh, adjectives are used to describe, you can sum it up by saying that they have an army of uh, public and private personnel that are involved in doing this as their regular day jobs. One of the things about China is there's massive legal support for the government, and when you analyze the legal uh, behind it, you can see almost no support for the little guy, right, the small people in the country. Uh, it just doesn't really exist. Perhaps it's a cultural thing. Perhaps it's uh, whatever the reason is. Uh, perhaps in the future they're going to need to address legislation that actually refers to you know, the rights of, of regular people. Uh, so the Great Firewall, we've heard about that, but if you're in China and you do searches for things like Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, you're liable not to get anything back or get very limited uh, returns back. Um, it appears just through testing that this is done at keyword of the National Gateway, but there's, it's sophisticated in China. So it's not just wholesale blocking. Um, you'll even see missing web pages within websites so, uh, where, uh, in where the content is seemingly consistent through the website. So somebody has gone in there and manually determined that that page is going to go. Uh, and the other thing which is really kind of creepy and interesting um, is it's been reported that blogs have not just disappeared but have actually been altered. Uh, so that's something to think about. And then in 2007 they said even so, even through all this, we can't keep up with it. There's going to be a renewed purification of the internet as affecting the development of socialist culture and no new cyber cafes for the year 2007. So here's a cool defacement from a Chinese hacker group on a Chinese government site. Turkmenistan, the guy on the top right, the Turkmenbashi, pretty much he was God in the country. And he said if you read his book every day, you would go to heaven. All the media was basically hymns and songs to this guy. Um, no internet access, a couple of approved websites, and the statistics I was able to pull up basically show it very, very dead last in, in, in most of the categories uh, for internet connectivity. This guy died at the end of last year. The new guy, he was elected on, um, at the beginning of the year, and his, uh, one of his election promises was free access to the internet. He came, in, he, so he came into office on February 14th, February 16th, opened two cyber cafes. Uh, Western reporter was there, said that the speed was pretty good, uh, but nobody showed up, right? So he was essentially sitting there by himself uh, connecting to, to the internet. There's one last defacement. Uh, does anybody want to guess at the number one country on the list? North Korea. And you might recognize a little guy up on the top, uh, top left. That's Kim Jong-il. 
And then if you look at the map, this is a satellite image of the country at night, of the peninsula at night. So you can kind of see a black space in between South Korea and China with a dot there for, for the capital. I imagine the internet space looks something similar. One of the things about North Korea is it reminds you a little about the novel is that how all the houses, all the domiciles are wired and the government has a radio um, feed going into the government to, to, uh, to tell the, uh, the people um, uh, current events. Uh, world's most isolated country. So the perceived threat from the internet is massive. Now in a country where, you know, like the guy's father, Kim Il-sung, in his biography, he says, you know, his first round of golf he ever played, 18 holes, he hit like 15 holes in one, right? In a country like that, you know, you can imagine that the threat from open access to the information is really just un unthinkable. Um, still, the guy appears to be fascinated with IT. Uh, in the year 2000, Madeleine Albright visited, gave him, gave her his personal email address. Uh, the chief of the military intelligence in South Korea said that the top graduates, some top graduates from the Kim Il-sung Military Academy have gone into an elite state-sponsored hacker unit with the, um, the targets being uh, uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Um, here's the building through which all internet traffic goes in and out of North Korea. Um, it's said that a few firms in North Korea with uh, ne needed R&D information uh, get some information through it. Uh, there's one school where you can learn about uh, computers and programming in the country, and they had invited uh, Western uh, reporters there. They take 100 male students a year, and they, do, they study English and programming. However, there's no access to the internet. So to just talk a little bit about the future, I just have a few slides left and just kind of look toward the future and only a few minutes left as well. Um, I think national security perceptions above all. That's, you know, government, that's the, when it gets up in the morning, that's the first thing it thinks about. Uh, and second is making money. And these are related to each other very closely. Um, so market forces and national security perceptions. Uh, to a certain extent, you'll see um, some countries, and I don't want to just focus on, on these countries, but you'll see countries uh, in quid pro quo agreement you know, um, you know, I give you an internet surveillance system, you vote for my skaters in the next Olympics. You know, that kind of stuff is done. Actually, I don't know if you heard that a couple years ago, but there's a big scandal in France and Russia were voting for each other's, uh, you know, um, um, skaters, right? Um, so uh, government objectives, uh, I think there's some realistic and unrealistic um, goals. I think probably you could restrict you know, wholesale, blatant attacks by the average user. But when people are willing to take a personal risk um, and they're clever uh, and they're helped by other people, I think you'll find that it'd be very difficult in, in cyberspace for governments to stay on top of this. And I think we've seen that definitely, um, you know, in, in Iran, in China, in Belarus, and so in some of these countries, you're going to have to be super draconian, like in Cuba, you know, in Myanmar, and North Korea, and just say you don't get a computer. You know, you're not going to have a computer. You're not going to connect to the internet. Uh, that's the only way you're going to prevent uh, sort of the unrealistic uh, goals of stopping uh, clever users from sophisticated attacks. And one of the reasons governments have a hard time staying on top is because uh, computer network defense is very difficult. It's hard to overstate. I think the challenges uh, in in doing this. Well, um, and then website contact, of course, is too dynamic, and you know, software just take for instance is changing every day. And of course, you get a patch, it's changed, it's done. It's, you can't trust it. Where's your basis for trust anymore? Once you've downloaded the one patch onto code that you had tried to uh, verify previously. Some of it is economics. I think, you know, you know you, as a despot or even a leader of a liberal market representative democracy, you have choices to make, and they're power or progress, right? And everybody knows that monopoly is going to hurt efficiency and it's going to hurt competition within your country and thus probably the vitality. And the internet is the perfect example of something that thrives on the exchange of information and sort of the, the, the comparison of good information with bad information, right? It's always helpful to, to look at things objectively and say, wow, you know, I've been doing that. I've been, you know, smoking crack for the last five years. Now I read a study that says that's, that's a great idea for my health. You know, it's, it's, it's always healthy to try and be objective and to, to weigh information against uh, other uh, arguments. Uh, and the internet is the best example of that. Um, 
One interesting article, Francis Fukuyama wrote uh, in, I believe in 89 or 90, an article which essentially said history ended, I think it was in 1812 or 1814, uh, the first big Napoleonic victory. He said, since then, we've known pretty much that some type of free economy, some type of representative democracy um, is the best way to move forward. And since, since then, he's argued that since that battle, um, it has basically been growing in fits and starts. And I don't want to overstate the comparison here, but, but I think there are some. And just to, in terms of uh, moving a country forward, um, some choices need to be made by leaders. Future of cyber resistance, I think privacy advocates should be somewhat optimistic. I think the internet probably has done more for freedom of expression, um, the growth of knowledge and understanding than any technology in history. Really, if you compare it to traditional um, media, um, you know, whenever there was a coup d'etat back in the day, um, the, you know, the first thing that the coup plotters would need to do at five in the morning is take the national radio station and the national television station. Um, so that, you know, later in the day, the first image you see is of the new leader. That's really not possible anymore with the Internet, you know, unless you are on top of everything that's coming into your country. Uh, it's much more difficult. Uh, and the Internet has done so much, I think, both for activists and ordinary people. These are some of the common tools. Uh, again, you know, you can just look in Saudi Arabia and see that everybody's going to buy an, a satellite. They say, I'm not going to go through the system. We're just going to buy a satellite and I'll connect to a Turkish or an Egyptian service provider. You know, and it'll be completely outside the system, and that's very common. Um, you know, co covert channels, essentially, I mean, they can be anything you want uh, to pass information back and forth. And if you allow the Internet in your country and you allow some exchange of information between, you know, your people and outside, it, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose control, per se. Um, but the thing is, I'd just like to emphasize on this slide, is creativity and evolution. So just, you know, it, one of the reasons that's important is because once a government finds out how you're communicating with the NGO outside your country, of course they're going to block it. Of course they're going to come arrest you, you know. So they know your tactic. They know that software, and they can see it, and they can key in on it. So that's why, I mean, it constantly has to be evolving, and, and it has to, you have to use imagination and creativity uh, moving forward. Uh, here's just one tool in the news, but at the University of Toronto, they have a cool tool called Siphon. It's especially written for countries just like we talked in the presentation. So essentially you could go home and download this tool and offer the connection information to anybody, say in China or wherever else, and they'll connect through your computer, encrypted connection, out to the uh, World Wide Web and have free access, theoretically, to, uh, um, uh, you know, to the wonders of the Internet. Uh, and at that point, if it works the way the designers have intended, of course, then the, the security relies just on the personal trust, and the government would have to somehow uh, perceive uh, a problem outside the normal um, uh, Internet traffic uh, that it would uh, rely on if it had a better signature. So there's no perfect attack and no, no perfect defense, but again, that means there's no magic bullet for any of us, for the government or for the regular folks. Um, so cyberspace is anarchic, but that's probably a, a good thing uh, moving forward. And just a small bit of advice is just to keep Keep uh, a more vigilant uh, look on things when uh, when things get dicey, when things are critical. You know, you see in Belarus with the elections, with the national referenda and stuff like that. F funny things always happen. They can't connect to the internet. It's really pretty crude on the part of the government, but but again, it's a indicative. And you'll see that things in cyberspace tend to relate pretty closely with events in real life. In the in the Middle East, every time there's an uptick in violence, you see web defacements go like crazy. And so th there's a pretty direct relationship. Last thing is, is if personal, personally targeted, I think you, know, you should look up this thing on the internet called the Moscow Rules. Uh, and you've got to finish the presentation, otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, I won't have enough time here. But truth in cyberspace requires a whole lot. And this is really only available to Big Brother usually. As a little guy, you're not going to have all these things in order to create sort of evidentiary proof of, of an attack in cyberspace. The human factor, that's you. Um, and that's what this is all for, to make sure the Internet is not in and of itself the, the goal uh, or the, uh, the important issue. Let's make it work uh, for us uh, instead of against us. Here's a, uh, uh, oops, show you one more. And again, these are, these, um, 
This clip is again at the beginning of the movie, so I'm not going to give anything away in our future movie. I forged government announcements and falsified figures quoted for agricultural and industrial As a result of mental disturbance dating from my experiences during the atomic wars, I was a willing subject of Goldstein's influence. I was stubborn and egocentric. When own life thoughts occurred to me, I reveled in them. I went into the proletarian zones. I had sex with prostitutes. I deliberately contracted syphilis. It was at this time that I made contact with the resistance. I was personally contacted by the arch traitor Goldstein and ordered to assassinate certain inner party officials. This I did. My agents forged documents and gained entry to the Ministry of Truth. Thought crime is death. Thought crime does not entail death. I deliberately passed Thought crime is death. death but the result I have committed, many even before setting pen to paper, the essential crime that contains all others I in also itself. I many hours of my free time, encouraging my agents to deface party posters and hoarding announcements. I read and memorized Goldstein's book. For 30 years, I have plotted to bring down the party. I was sick in mind and body. Together with my colleagues, Aronson and Rutherford, I did counter the important party documents, including the ex-London permits and travel passes, and that by use of these documents, my agents travelled freely throughout Airstrip 1, encouraging insurrection and organising a massive counterplot to destroy the inmost faction of the Oceania. April the 4th, 1984. So you'll see he found the one place and the one technology uh, that he could sit and circumvent government control and authority. So um, I'll just suggest to you that, that um, you know, that looking toward the future, uh, you know, I think the, you, you, you know, the, um, as I said, I think the, uh, it falls to all of us to play some type of role in making sure that the, the uh, um, you know, the good and evil in cyberspace uh, that war is fought uh, correctly and well, and, and uh, um, I think you know, each one of us individually can play a part. So anyway, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. And any questions you have, you can either email me or, or chat with me later. I'll be around. Thanks. Uh, let's see. I've been to. Uh, I've been to Zimbabwe. That's a good question. Let's see. Oh, he asked how many of these countries had I been to myself. Oh, here's the bibliography of sources. Um, I have been to Zimbabwe. I have been to. I think that's the only country that I've been. I've been to about 50 countries or so. And I've been throughout Eastern Europe. I've been through lots of Africa and the Middle East. I could have certainly picked other countries I have been to that are low performers in terms of human rights. So, you know, I've been uh, in most of Eastern Europe. I've been from uh, you know, Egypt down to South Africa. Um, and I've been around the Middle East, places like Syria. Uh, so, please, can you follow up? Yeah. 
Yeah, he was, he's curious about how much this ties to my own personal experience. Uh, I think the, uh, I've only been to Zimbabwe on the list, which I really developed sort of a soft place in my heart for while I was there. Um, let's see. I mean, some of the countries, like I've been to Ethiopia, I've been to, you know, Kenya, I've been to Tanzania, this is close. Um, unfortunately, I haven't traveled much in Asia. Some of the countries are Asian. I haven't been to Belarus, but I've been to Poland, Estonia, Russia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. Um, so I've been around. I've been to like 50 countries. I spent about four years backpacking. Um, I studied, worked overseas. Um, I'm not done. I'm so sorry. Here's a question. Apologies. No, no, no. Here's the thing. There's a Q&A room, so you can ask more questions.